everybody. Um, I hope you're all fed and watered with caffeine and biscuits because it's going to be quite interactive, so you might need the sugar or the caffeine hit. <laughs> I do come in. Great. So um, anybody who follows me on Twitter will notice that I talk a lot about penguins um, and not a lot else. So um, the penguins have come to you, we're pleased to know. So um, a bit more about my day job, just to give you some sort of idea. So I'm a medical statistician, the University of Liverpool, and what's officially called a tenure track fellow, which is the university's version of a probationary lecturer. Uh, so at some point I might get a permanent contract. <laughs> at some point. But I am also um, a STEM ambassador. Does everybody know what a STEM ambassador is? So um, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. And STEM ambassadors are volunteers who go into schools at least once a year to do something related to their job, to try and convince the next generation that their career is amazing or that numerical skills are great or that science is fantastic. And I also am a member of the Royal Statistical Society's Teaching Statistics Special Interest Group. It used to be called the Education and Statistical Literacy Committee. That was then disbanded and then the teaching stats stick appeared. So I have various hats on. But it's in the latter that I'm here today. There are no formulae, I'm afraid, and there's definitely nothing medical statistics related. But hopefully it will be engaging nonetheless. So the activities that I'm going to talk about today were developed under the guise of the Statistics and Education Literacy um, Committee. So they were co-developed by Simon White from the BSU in Cambridge, Scott Kerr, who at that time was the Education Manager for the RSS, and myself. And the whole point of them is to try and get past the barrier of kids going, I hate maths, maths is boring. It's all socks in a drawer and balls in a bag. We kind of need to do better than that. You know, great that they remember that there's something to do with socks in a drawer, but we need to kind of go beyond that to make it real world applicable. So Scott, Simon and I are frequently, or were frequently asked to go and do events. And we're always like, oh yeah, but what do we do? What, what do we take with us? And there's some really amazing, expensive pieces of kit you can take into schools. So the golden board where you drop marbles at the top and it comes up with a nice uniform or a normal distribution depending on how you weight it. Great. It doesn't fit on a train and it costs a fortune. Therefore, I don't think it really works as a transportable piece of kit. So we wanted to come up with something low tech. And by low tech, I mean something you could buy on Amazon or a kit that you could print off or put together that you could take on a train to a school in the middle of nowhere to convince them that stats is amazing. So that was our sort of premise. And we have eight activities that have been developed and tested, and they're available on the RSS website. You can see the link up there. And each of them are described in a similar way. So um, we launched them in, four, oh, in three sets. The first one was in 2017, and um, the first one was called How to Always Win. And as I say, all the demonstration sheets are identical across the set, so they're always using this format. We have the title of the activity, an activity summary, because you can guarantee when you say to a school, yeah, I'll come in and do an event, they go, great, what are you going to do? Well, you can copy and paste this bit, and the teacher will be really pleased. We've got our shopping list, what you need to buy, the dreaded activity learning outcomes. If you've ever been on the end of an email and the teacher goes, so what are the learning outcomes? Um, you can now copy and paste the learning outcomes, as well as the risk assessment, my other favourite email from a teacher, the dreaded risk assessment. So again, copy and paste. We've then got the how to run the activity. This is the bit that you kind of need to memorise, because this is how to make it work. Then we've got the exploring bit. So <laughs> this is the bit I always keep in reserve. For the child that comes to you going, I know this one, I've done this one before, or asks you the really awkward question that you weren't quite expecting. Um, so these are kind of the how you'd extend the activity a bit further. Then you've got the teacher parent happy bit, where you explain the theory behind the activity that they've done. And then um, there's some additional information for those who are really, really keen. The activity des are designed to run in about five minutes, because normally you're at a science festival or science fair where you have thousands of children in a massive hall, you're trying to drag them to your stall because yours looks the best, and you keep their attention for a few minutes maximum. 
but with a bit of statistical know-how, Simon and I and many others have been able to extend these sort of three to five minute activities to 20 minutes or multiple together, you can fill an hour or an hour and a half. So um, it's possible to think through how to extend these into something slightly longer. But ultimately, they're sort of a quick and easy way in to statistics. Now, each of them has um, an accompanying video. And if I can cope with the embarrassment, I'd just like to show you the first video because the other seven videos are of a similar style, but you'll get to see what we're trying to do and how we go about it. It's just not very nice watching yourself back on video. Hello, would you like to have a go at Ludo? Yeah. Okay, if you wouldn't mind having a seat, that would make it a bit easier. So if we perch on the edge. So, although they're small, I have two dice here. One of them is what we describe as random dice, and one of them is what we call biased dice. Have you heard the word biased before? Yeah. So what would you take that to mean? Not balanced. Okay, not balanced. That's a good description. So we're saying that one number might be more favoured than the others, yeah. not equal chance. So have a feel of those two dice. It's easier if you feel them as a pair. And see if you can identify if there's a difference between them, and then think about which one you think might be biased and which one might be a random dice. Feel free to roll it if that's easier. That one's a lot heavier. Yeah. Okay, so what might heavier mean? It's got a weight. Okay, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends how evenly it's distributed. Okay, yeah, good answer. So what might we need to do to work out if it's a good thing or a bad thing? Have a few rolls. Yeah, absolutely. So have a go, roll them, see which one you fancy. Six. Okay. Okay, so we're going to play a game of Ludo in a minute and you're going to get to pick which dice you want to play with. Okay. And we're going to do the shortened game of Ludo. So to give you a clue on the rules, you need to roll a six to get out of the house, which is this area here. And then we're going to play the short version, so you're just going to follow the dark circles up the middle. So you'll need to roll a six and then a five or more to win. So with that information, which dice would you like to play with? You can either play with one each, or I can play with one and you two as a pair can play with the other one. Yeah. Okay, so you two as a team play with that one. What we're now going to do is you're both going to play with that dice. So if you play with the blue ones and you play with the purple, and we need to roll a six to get the um, character out of the house, and then at least a five on the next roll to get up to the middle. So why don't you go first? Okay, you got... Six, great. So you get the character out of the house, and you get another roll. A three, okay. So if you move your character three places, brilliant. And now it's your go with the purple counters. Ah, oh, six, great. So you get to go out of the house, and you get another roll. What have we got? A one this time. Okay, my turn. Oh, no, a three. I'm stuck where I am. The blue counters again, your roll. Great, a two, oh, not quite there yet. Purple counters, you'll go. A four, oh, nearly, nearly. My turn, let's see if I can get out of the house. Oh, I'm still stuck where I am. Great, blue counters, you'll go again. And a six, great, into the middle to finish it off. Brilliant, so you did pick the bias die. It's leading to a six slightly more often, but as you've seen, you do get other numbers too. And the reason is that it's not a perfectly biased die, it doesn't always lead to a 6. It has a weight on the 1, which is why it's heavier, and so it does tend to lead to a 6 more often. This is the random die that has an equal chance of all 6 numbers. And so, um, although we can use it to cheat at games like this, a more useful application is if we're doing a clinical study and we need more patients in one group than another, we can use something like a biased die to get those increased patient numbers. Uh, so thank you for taking part. You get a tiny mini dice. Thank you. thank you very much. Okay, so um, not the best video ever, I admit, but um, as you'll discover if you ever try and record yourself throwing dice, it's really complicated and long because they never lead to the same two numbers twice. Um, but um, the purpose of that is to help you um, work out how to run the activity. So if you read the sheet and are still confused as to how to run the activity, each of them has a video that you can watch as a kind of demonstration. And one of the things we're particularly keen on is that the activities have a real life purpose. Because 
when you say to kids, oh, well, what do you remember from maths or stats? It's always, oh, balls in a bag and socks in a drawer. But they can't link that to why that's useful, apart from <coughs> to get a GCSE in maths. So we need to do the next step, which is why at the end of that video, we said, OK, so you can use a bias dice to win a game, but actually it has some real life application in clinical studies. And you can change that to whatever your area of interest is, but we would always urge you to put on the real life application at the end so that it's not just some abstract con a concept. And Simon and I have written some of these activities up for publication in the journal Teaching Statistics. So the one you've just watched um, was one of those articles that's in Teaching Stats. And this is where we extend the five minute version to a full hour long classroom based description. So in Teaching Stats, they're very interested in classroom based. So um, we talk about a short version and then extend it to a full hour long activity with various experiments. Okay. So that's the first activity. The second one is biased sampling. So this um, is where we use an <coughs> opaque bag with a variety of objects in it. Before healthy eating schools, it used to be chocolate, but of course you're not allowed to do that anymore. So now we have marbles and dice and all sorts of random <coughs> objects. We get pupils to pick out a number of them and weigh them, and they then have to guess the weight of the entire bag. Um, and again, they always overestimate because we pick out big objects. So if you fill it with lots of small objects, we explain how we need to be a bit more selective than just picking the first things we come across. Again, clinical trials, because that's our area of expertise. Stick or switch, this is, I say, the classic Monty Hall problem, but many pupils haven't heard of Monty Hall. But this is another example of conditional probabilities. So there are three doors. I spent ages making these sets and laminating them all. But anyway, there are three doors. <laughs> um, there's a goat behind two of them and a car behind one of them. You get a pupil to pick a door without opening it. Then because you're nice, because you want them to win, you open another door to reveal a goat and they get the chance of sticking with their original door or swapping to another one. Mathematicians in the room will be happy to say we should swap because there's a two thirds chance of winning in that case. But it takes an awful lot of persuading because they believe that it's a third, a third and a third. So it's a kind of demonstration of conditional probabilities. But then you need to think, what's the real life application? Well, actually, it's kind of like Bayesian. We're updating with more knowledge as we go along. So we talk about the fact that we often get information along somebody's journey in a clinical study or in life. So we have to update what we think might happen based on that knowledge. And then the last one in set one is how random are you? And this is a really easy to do game it lasts about a minute and you only need a dice. So it's perfect for when somebody all of a sudden says, can you come tomorrow and do an event? <coughs> um, you get the pupils to guess a number between one and six. You get them to roll a dice and see what it leads to. And you plot both on a histogram. And you can see that over the course of the day, you get um, a normal distribution for the human guesses and a uniform distribution for the dice which if you happen to live in Liverpool and you say, how random are you? Most of the kids will turn around and go, oh, well random me, I'm well random. And we can go, actually, you're not. <laughs> I would perfect the Scouse accent, but it, it's not happened yet. I've been there far too many years and I still can't do Scouse. But yes, yeah, so it's a really cool demo that actually people think they're random and we can prove that they're not, albeit not with formulae. So that's set one, and all of those are available to download. And the bias sampling one has also been published in Teaching Stats, so again, that extends to an hour-long one quite easily. So in 2018, we thought, well, we'd better come up with a second set. And these are my favourite ones. Um, so these are the ones that I'm focusing on today. I think some of you are aware of some of them, but um, it's always good for a refresh. <laughs> so how many penguins? Sociable cards, capture, recapture, and radiotherapy. Within each of the sets we've come up with so far, we try and have at least one that is suitable from age three upwards, and at least one that is mainly targeted at sixth form and what used to be called gifted and talented, and is now called whatever it is, something to do with um, high achievers or whatever the phrase is. So in set one, our three and upwards was how random are you, because everybody can roll a dice and guess a number. Although and interestingly, three-year-olds are very bad at guessing a number between one and six. 10 comes off a huge amount. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, and the advanced one was the stick or switch because conditional probabilities and tree diagrams are quite complicated. In this set, the um, how many penguins is our three and upwards, although you have to modify the numbers a little bit. If they can count to it on their fingers, it's a lot more successful. 
and the advanced extension one is the radiotherapy, which I'll talk a bit more about momentarily. I'm going to start with my personal favourite, how many penguins? So here I have a laminated sheet. It's the same picture as you can see there. It's taken from space and it's of something brown on the snow in Antarctica relating to penguins. Hands up with a suggestion as to what the brown stuff is. Yes, excellent. You have to watch pupils very carefully at this point. If their mouth looks like it's about to be an S, you have to point out that it begins with a P definitely begins with a P. So it's poo, penguin poo. And we can use that information to tell us how many penguins there are. And this is really important because if you want to work out how many penguins there are to make sure that we're keeping up um, the, the numbers and we're not damaging our environment too much, it's really expensive to go to Antarctica to count them. They all look the same. So therefore, it's difficult practically to count them, and it's really cold. So we need a better way of doing it. So we have these aerial photos. Now, if I was doing this as a classroom-based activity, I would then get the pupils to work out the surface area. Now, in GCSE maths, everything for the surface area is a nice shape. All of a sudden, you throw in this that is not a nice shape, and they freak out completely as to how to calculate the surface area. But we can do it. We work out that there's 150,000 metres squared of poo, which is a huge amount of poo. Okay, I now need a volunteer. There is a prize in it, so it is worth volunteering, but I do need a volunteer. There are five more volunteers required throughout the afternoon just to get that into your minds. What's the prize? <laughs> you get a penguin-themed prize. Excellent, are you my volunteer? Perfect, great. You can stay seated for a moment. <laughs> okay, so has anybody seen a penguin a bit nearer to home than the Antarctic? And I don't mean on TV, I'm thinking of a live one. Yeah, where have we seen them? Sue, so, excellent. So you need to have slightly vivid imaginations. These are our zoo penguins. For health and safety reasons, I'm not allowed to take a waddle of actual penguins to any school festivals. It's a bit of a shame though. So if you wouldn't mind coming up, I would like you to pick three of your penguins of choice, please. <laughs> They're all the same, just slightly different. <laughs> it's really funny, the younger the pupil is, the more they pick it up like a proper penguin and you know, <coughs> hold it under the wings. Fantastic, thank you very much. What can you see under the penguins that you've moved? Uh, yeah, the... Um surface of the poo? Yep, there's an emoji of poo, yeah, yeah. and next to it is the amount of poo that this penguin has produced in a year. Mm -hmm. So using my ridiculously sized calculator, would you mind calculating the mean amount of poo, please? Yeah. So this is when we would say to a pupil, how do you calculate the mean? What is the mean? And then we talk about means, medians, and modes, because they all think of the average and that dreaded term. Having a ridiculous sized calculator helps to get them engaged. Great, so it's 16.3 metres squared on average per penguin. Now, if that's the total surface area, how many penguins does that mean are in that photo? What do we need to do to the surface area? So uh, we should divide. Yep, absolutely. So 150, <laughs> just put you on the spot, you know. Um, so we want to divide the total surface area by the amount per penguin. So 150,000 divided by 16.3. I'm afraid it hasn't got a memory function on it. It's not yeah. quite exciting enough for that. I really want a scientific calculator that's A4 size, but they don't invent them yet. Yep. Great, thank you very much. Perfect. And you get a penguin themed prize. Well, thank you very you much. So much. Thank you. So you've just calculated that there are 9,202 penguins in that photo. And this is usually where the kids turn around and go, wow. Because by fairly basic maths and a photo of some poo on the snow, and some soft toy penguins, we've actually come up with a, reali a realistic estimate of how many penguins there are in that colony. And then you can get into all sorts of additional discussions. It always is worth having done the maths beforehand for all the different combinations, because when they all of a sudden come up with 600 or 20,000, you can perhaps get them to check that their answers are right. The, for the poo samples that I've set up, there's somewhere between six and 10,000 penguins. So obviously you can extend this quite easily. What if I take a different sample of three penguins? What if they're different types of penguins? Can I compare an emperor penguin with a rock copper penguin? 
And then that, of course, from a stats point of view, means we can talk about standard error of the mean, 95% confidence intervals, 99% confidence intervals, and so on and so forth. And what's the real life application? Well, we've done it. We've worked out how many penguins there are in Antarctica. We can do that in any other situation where it's inaccessible, but there is some marker that is left behind that we can use. It does work remarkably well with snow. Um, sand is a bit more complicated. So here we've introduced populations, samples, estimates, confidence intervals, and we've got the real life application of we take a sample to tell us something about the whole group. So in my med medical case, I'm thinking about testing a new drug on a random sample of people to see if it works. So not just the penguin application, but we're talking bigger medical application as well. And um, this article we published in Teaching Stats, much to the embarrassment of Simon, who was like, we can't publish an article on penguin poo. I was like, yeah, we can, yeah, we can. It's like, are you serious? And not only that, it's just been awarded the Peter Holmes Prize for 2019 as the most um, engaging stats activity in their publication for the year. So I was really excited that my suggestion of doing an article on penguin poo has not only been published, but has now won a prize too. So, you know. Okay, so moving on from penguins, um, our next activity is sociable cards. I need four volunteers for this. The only prerequisite is that you have to be able to count. Now, that shouldn't be a problem, but you'd be surprised. That's all I'm saying. So four volunteers, please. Excellent. One, just three to go. Excellent. Two, three, four. Perfect. If you'd like to come to the front, please. So all you need to do, say all, is to pick a beanbag of choice and follow the trail of playing cards. So... You use the number on the card to move that many places, so this is a four, so you'd move forward four places. The complications are the aces, which are one, and the picture cards, which are a five. And the aim is to follow the trail. If you get to a card and you've run out of options, so if you land on, say, a nine and you've only got three left, then stop on the nine. And it'll be interesting to see where you end up. So who'd like to be blue? Excellent. So if you'd like to start from a health and safety point of view, we'll stagger the start. Yes. <laughs> and then whoever's on red, if you'd like to then follow. I suggest you put the beam... Yeah, go for it. That's it. Okay. Next on the yellow. And then on green. <laughs> this is a really good one to do in a pub when adults have had a few pints. So um, you can do this with ridiculous tiny playing cards and with massive playing cards that people stand on, depending on the space you've got and how much of a show you're trying to do of it. Now I know the answer, but this is always where it's a little bit scary. Ooh, okay. So two beanbags are on the same card. <laughs> yep. Three beanbags. Oh, Four beanbags. Excellent. Phew. Excellent. And in which case, have a penguin prize each. Thank you for taking part. Thank you. Okay. Go. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I'm pleased to say that all four adults on this occasion could count. <laughs> you can't really do this one with three year olds. Probably from about ten, it's okay. But um, it turns into soft clay if you're not too careful. And also, they can't count reliably. So you need an adult to guide them through it. It's possible to do with small groups of small children, but you just need to get somebody to guide them through. So I would then do it. Each person does one move, then the next person, and you can check that they're doing it correctly. So you've all ended up on the same card, which is a relief. I did check it beforehand, um, but yes. So here we've introduced a concept called crystals count. So this is a maths principle related to coupling methods for Markov chains, for those in the know. Basically, there's a point at which, along the journey, you all end up on the same card. And from there onwards, the path is the same. But there's a real-life application for this, which is kind of annoying. Um, it's Pollard's kangaroo method. So the way I explain this to school <coughs> groups is, if you move GP practices... You need your records to move from where you are currently to your new GP. Back in my day of being a dinosaur, we'd have posted it. It wasn't very secure, but that's how it worked. Nowadays, we use email. 
but it's not particularly safe to just email everything that I know about you in an email. So we want to encrypt it. And one way of doing that is through this Pollard's kangaroo. So it splits your record into multiple pieces, like my four starting points. Then it sends them in an email, and at some point they converge and get back to something sensible at the end. And so this is the real life application in this case. It is one of those that you have to test in advance. In theory, it should always work, but as I proved about five times today when setting it up, today was not my day. Um, but normally you would just shuffle a set of cards, lay them out, and it works about 90% of the time. I was just really unlucky. And then if people are feeling really brave, you can say, well, don't believe me, well, try from the other end. And then you can prove it that way around as well. Or you can get them to swap a few cards and try it again. The health and safety one for this is that if you're doing it on the floor, it can be slippy. So I usually try and do it on a table with beanbags. So that's my sociable cards one. The next one is capture recapture. So I need a volunteer for this one, but you can stay seated. Excellent, fantastic. Right. So I have a pack of playing cards here, although on the train I got them out of the box and I've lost a few on the way. So, I could, of course, sit there, count them all out, and work out how many I've got. But if I'd got a massive pack of cards, or multiple packs of cards, that's not very practical. So instead, what we're going to do is to use the capture-recapture method, which statisticians are probably familiar with. So what I'd like you to do is to pick out randomly 15 cards, please. This is where I have to use technology. Mm. Are you familiar with the decks of cards? I did this as a demo in a school once and went, are you familiar with the part? And they're like, there's a picture of something round, and I went, oh no, it's not going to work. Okay. Okay, great. So if you could shout out what they are, number and deck, please, and I'm going to attempt to write neatly. You've got three of spades, <coughs> five of diamonds, queen of spades, four of hearts, of spades, seven of spades, ace of hearts, nine of hearts, queen of diamonds, king of hearts, ace of diamonds, six of hearts, ten of diamonds, queen of hearts, and queen of clubs. Uh, okay, so if you could now shuffle them all back together please. This is definitely one where I pass the cards over to someone else because <laughs> I can't shuffle them, I just end up dropping them off. Oh, sorry. Um, haven't quite worked out the entire technology. Okay. Should I be worried that there's this red light on the desk? That means the coin that's good. Okay, cool. <laughs> <coughs> Great. Okay, and then pick out another 15, please. So what I need then everybody in the audience to do, somehow, if I could work out how to is to look for any pairs, but we'll sort that out in a moment. I'm going to go back to this way just for a minute and hang on at one. some abstract maths challenge but um, we're now looking for anything that's in common across the two so has anybody spotted any there's definitely a queen of diamonds four of hearts four of hearts queen of tubs queen of hearts queen of hearts queen of hearts queen of spades yeah so that's queen of hearts mm -hmm. any other matches Four of hearts on the other side. That's the one, thank you. I knew I was one short. Okay, are we happy then? <coughs> That's a funny angle. Uh, nine of hearts, isn't it? Yeah, well spotted. 
Perfect. I appreciate it's a little bit funny when you've got to sit from the angle. Okay. So now we can do what I say, the magic. So now we can work out how many cards we had in a pack. Can anyone think of the maths? I wouldn't normally get pupils to work this out, but as I'm in a room full of mathematicians. No. <laughs> you can do it with that, but that's one of the extension bits rather than this. So what I need to do is to multiply the number in my first set by the number in my second set divided by those in common. So I had 15 in each set. Again, ridiculous size calculator. And then we had one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six in common. So based on that, we've worked out we've got 37 and a half cards. Well, that's not ridiculous. It can only be 52, and I knew I'd lost a few. So although we've only got a small sample, 37, 38 is not bad. There's actually 40 in there, so I'm quite pleased with that. Um, and obviously we can talk about how this works for much bigger data sets. So if I can do a bit of a technology sweeps, I'll swap you some cards for a penguin. And again, notice the novelty size playing cards. You can use normal size, but why not use novelty size ones because it's more fun. Okay, great. So we can use this to think about extensions, repeating the activity, exploring variability. If we were to use exactly the same pack and take samples of the same size, what would that have um, impact in terms of the number? What happens if I was to only take five cards out of this, um, the pack? And the dreaded question, when might it be unreasonable to assume that capturing has no effect on the recapture? If I obviously take 40 cards out, I've got none left to resample, so I know there's definitely 40. So we have to balance our sample size. So that's a really nice way to talk about sample size calculations. And also, if you were thinking about animals, have they learnt that you stand there with a piece of meat three times a week and they go, oh, I'll just go for my lunch. Now, Simon, I'm very jealous, he has 200 rubber ducks in his office. And I'm so jealous because I've only got tiny playing cards. <coughs> I do have soft toy penguins. But he has um, 200 ducks, 100 of them are pink and 100 of them are yellow. And he does exactly the same activity that we've just done. He just puts them in two giant buckets and he has a mat that fills the floor with the numbers 1 to 100. And he gets the kids to race the pink bucket versus the, the yellow bucket to place as many, pink, um, as many ducks as they can on the relevant number, capture and recapture. So that's a really nice classroom-based activity, but it doesn't fit into my can you transport it on a train option. So here we're thinking about inference. Again, we're talking about estimates, samples, populations. And the real-life application is... This is how we estimate the size of a population. It's not just good fun, especially with the ducks. Cool. You can sit down if you'd like, because I'm done on the practical bit. <laughs> I've just realised you're carefully poised. Great. And the um, last of the second set of activities is um, to do with radiotherapy. So remember, this is our sort of advanced one. We have a sheet that mimics the human body. We have a tumour cell in the middle, and then we have some sort of fake cells around the outside. This has to be caveated with you need to check with the teachers at the school first whether this is an appropriate topic. It's not that we should avoid it as a topic, but we just need to be a bit sensitive. If someone has a parent who's got cancer, there's not a reason that we shouldn't do the activity, but we should know that when we talk about it. For example, it would be inappropriate to say that this is a game. We don't make up games for treatments. You know, This is an actual demonstration of how we do fine dose the um, radiotherapy. <coughs> so what we are trying to do with this activity is to maximise damage to the tumour cell but minimise damage to all the healthy cells around it. So we use counters for this game and they have to move in a straight line. Obviously things don't wiggle. And we've set some conditions whereby um, a cell <coughs> will absorb the radiotherapy if it equal or exceeds the value in the cell when rolled. And so Simon has um, done this really nice video of it in action. I'll show you some of it just because uh, we got quite excited when we did this video. And it's got some um, 
um, sped up footage, which I quite like. That's going to represent a person. So this person has a tumour, and what we want to do is we want to hurt or kill that tumour using radiotherapy. Now the way, the way radiotherapy works is you shoot beams and you kind of want the beams to hit the tumour mass and damage it. So we're going to represent the beams as dice. And so you're going to take a marker and start somewhere on the map and then roll your dice and you move in a straight line. So the beam travels in a straight line. Um, when you roll, any dice that have that number or higher get absorbed into that cell. So these are the healthy cells that we want to try and keep healthy and we want to try and hit the cheap. Now any cell that has three or more dice in is damaged and so you want to try and avoid that. So each of you will get a marker so you get to start wherever you want and you get to pick as many dice as you want to start rolling. So where do you want to start? And Have a look at the map and how many dice do you want to start with? You start there, and how many dice do you want? Ten. Ten, okay. So that's six, nine, and ten. There you go, and how many? Uh, start there, and how many dice? Uh, eight. So, just, yeah, so we're going to do four, and another four. So there you go, and start with four. I'll take those out here. That's a lot of stuff there. Yeah. Okay, and the activity continues in that vein. So we're thinking about um, moving through the whole body to get out the other side, causing as minimum damage as possible. Um, as I say, this is one of the more advanced topics because when you come to assemble the results, it works quite well to use um, a package we've written that's available on GitHub to combine it across a room. So you'd get all the tables in a room to have a go and then you would accumulate those scores over the day and you can plot the results to see the optimum starting point and number of dice, i.e. dose. Um, and so we can talk about extensions where we repeat exactly the same dose, so you start in the same place with the same number of dice, but of course, because of the dice rolls, you're not going to get the same results. And then, of course, you can vary the starting points, the direction, the number of dice, and you get into an infinite size problem quite quickly. Um, when we published this in Teaching Stats, they asked us to draw a tree diagram of all the possible options. We weren't very amused. We did it for um, two dice. Um, or two starting positions, and then said, you can see this is going to get too big, but <clears throat> interesting. And then we can talk about what if there were multiple tumour cells. So you can easily extend this to a big problem. And of course, this is a simulation study. And most people haven't heard of a simulation study until they're potentially a PhD student, but at least a final year undergrad. So it's a really nice way to introduce people to this concept much earlier on in their career. And of course, this is a slightly simplified version, but this is how we find the right dose. We do complex scans to work out the pathway. From that we maximise um, or look at the best possible starting position and we think about the best possible dose. It just happens that behind the scenes is a computer package that's doing all of these calculations for us without us having to sit there and do each of them manually. And this is currently under peer review for the second time with um, teaching stats, so hopefully that will be published soon. So there are, I know I'm going over, I'll be brief, but um, there are um, four more activities in the making which are due to launch at this year's RSS conference. You get a slight sneak pre a preview today. Um, the first one is can you beat the bolt? So can you beat Usain Bolt? This involves dropping a ruler and seeing the distance it takes you to catch the ruler. I'm rubbish at it. I can drop a 30 centimetre ruler. I've even got a 50 centimetre ruler and I can quite happily miss completely. But it seems that children are a lot better than I am. But we then equate that centimetre droppage to a reaction time and we can plot that. Um, we have an activity here, which is one of my favourites, um, which is to do with meerkats. And we're basically simulating human growth curves. 
So we, the meerkats have been lovingly um, modified to weigh different amounts. A huge amount of sewing involved. Anyway, um, and so you get the pupils to weigh a meerkat and then plot their results and then think about whether they're in a particular quartile. And then we talk about, well, does it matter what quartile they're in? Actually, what's more interesting is their longitudinal profile. So what quartile have they been in along their journey? And this is how we would obviously measure newborn babies and babies over their first few months of life. But I, again, can't use real babies in science experiments, so meerkats it is. And then the second two, um, this one um, is to do with Lego because Simon's desperate to get Lego involved somehow. But this is going to be um, random walks with absorbing states because obviously you can build up quite nicely 3D uh, absorbing walls. And the final one is to do with Sudokus and spotting patterns where you don't necessarily think patterns might be. So there's going to be a series of coloured Sudoku patterns to see if people can um, complete them. And again, in each case, we're trying to point out the real life application. And I've got, a, 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 I'd quite like to do this activity too. So I recently discovered that Wombat's Poo is cubic. And this is just the most amazing thing ever. Apparently we've known that Wombat Poo has been cubic for a very long time, but we didn't know why, and we now know why. But I just think it's amazing, because I've got all these images in my head of, you know, like the brown cubes that you used to have in school maths lessons that stacked. I'm just thinking we can do modes, medians, means. It's all just stacking cubes, but if we call it Wombat Poo, all of a sudden I think that's going to be a lot more appealing than mean, median, and modes. So I, I really want to do that. And plus, how cute is the Wombat? I really want a soft toy wombat sat on the desk. Anyway, okay, so there are eight existing activities that are available on the RSS website. Buy a sampling, how random are you, how to always win, stick or switch was set one. How many penguins, sociable cards, capture, recapture, and radiotherapy are set two. Four more to follow and possibly five more to follow if I can get the wombat poo one working. Great, does anybody have any questions? <coughs> Five minutes or so for, for questions or, or comments or thoughts. Um, well, I've, I've, I've got a, a slightly cheeky question. How, how far can we borrow the ideas? If you want yeah, absolutely. So the ideas are ready to go. You can download the resources off the RSS website. You can use the activity sheets, all the, the photo of the poo on the snow, the radiotherapy maps, they're all available to download. We just ask that you credit the RSS when you do so. And if you really fancy citing a journal article, those teaching staff are <coughs> great. <laughs> but yeah, they're, they're made to be used. Um, there's been about 5,000 website hits since they first went in 2017, um, and about three or 400 downloads of the activity materials. So people are clearly using them. So um, the other way around, we probably shouldn't, but I was hooked on the idea of penguin poo because there was a significance article that it got. It was talking about how higher quality images were enabling us to go beyond looking at photos of poo and actually being able to look at photos of penguins and how AI was helping us to count those penguins. But I just kind of got fixated by the whole, it's a photo of poo on snow, we can do something with that. So there tends to be some sort of hook that gets me involved in the first place. Hence the wombat cubic poo thing. I'm thinking through the activity. And then, because it's a statistical concept we're demonstrating, there's always a real world link. You just have to think what that is. Did you make them yourself or did you get them somewhere? No, I bought the penguins. Fortunately, I bought them in January in the post Christmas sale. So they were quite cheap. <laughs> nice. Because unfortunately, I don't have any budget for um, yeah. activities which is why we try and make them as cheap as possible. So if you, so I've worked with quite a lot of teachers who want to do the penguin activity, and so they just print off pictures. Mm. If you're working with a primary school, you can link it to the wider curriculum by getting the pupils to design some penguins for homework that have to look like particular types of penguins. They bring in 10 penguins that they've made or colored in, and then you use those for the activity. So it can be as cheap as you like. Um, you know, Simon's got 200 rubber ducks, I've got a pack of playing cards, I won in a cracker. Uh, so you can adapt all of it to whatever you need. Sorry, <laughs> this is not a 
statistical question. It's a biological one. Mm -hmm. The wombat, the cubic wombat yeah. pose yeah. fascinates me. I mean, see what's the, advantage, <coughs> the evolutionary advantage? And did you, did so I gather why? that their digestive process is so slow yeah. that the poo comes out in squares, whereas all other animals, it's a much quicker transition, so therefore it isn't square. It's like the edges get shaved off because it's flying out, whereas it's so <laughs> slow at the end. And apparently this was to avoid detection, because, because um, they are quite a small animal, they were at risk of being eaten, so they needed a slower digestive system so that you couldn't trace them as to where they'd left any um, waste. The things you learn, yeah. But if anybody can think of an activity that I can do based on square poo, I'm, I'm amazed. <laughs> Thank you very much. No problem. Thank you.